So first off, I just want to thank everybody for joining and taking the time out of your day to, to look at the demo and uh, see what Atmosphere is all about. Um, just a quick introduction. Uh, my name is John Stemble, and I'm a product manager here at Atlas IAD. Uh, I had the privilege of being the product manager for, for Atmosphere, so uh, very excited to see this thing come to life and, uh, and to be launched. Um, uh, so uh, how we're going to spend our time today is we're going to go through a quick overview of uh, the Atmosphere hardware, which includes um, the host processors, uh, the amplifiers, and then also the uh, accessories that, that are included as part of the ecosystem. Um, so that we'll do that first, and then we'll go into um, more of the live demo where uh, we dive into the user interface uh, a little, in a little more deep level. Um, so with that, let's uh, get going. Uh, so just if you had missed the launch of the product, uh, I just wanted to point out a few things and answer the question of what, well, what is Atmosphere. Uh, so Atmosphere is a, uh, a full solution. It's a full ecosystem that includes, as I mentioned, uh, processors, amplifiers, accessories, and then the, the UI uh, to uh, configure the whole thing. Um, just some driving ideas behind what the Atmosphere product line is. Um, so uh, we want to make things as, as easy as possible for both uh, the installer and then the end user to use. So ease of installation, um, you know, where we could cut down on time and, and difficulty for installation, we, we went ahead and did that. Um, and then on the, on the end user side of things, um, you know, there's a lot of products that are pro and consumer are um, um, a lo pro level audio equipment basically that's that can actually be fairly difficult for end users to use um, in, in those commercial spaces so the, the, the touch points where the end customer is actually the one interacting with the system we tried to make um, more, more consumer like things that they were they would um, typically run to a, at home and, and things that they're just used to seeing and touching um, so those are some of the drivers um, and I just want to point out also that although this is a, a set of products and this is a, a launch of a, an, an ecosystem, uh, this really isn't the end of the, of the product line. Um, this is a, a platform that is going to be carried forward and in, um, changed over time, and we're going to, we're going to, uh, to produce more products uh, from this. Um, so a lot of effort went into this, especially when you're platforming. It, it does take a lot of, of man years there. We said we have 30 man years invested in this thing. And it, like I said, it's just the tip of the spear for Alice IED as, as we move forward. Um, so to answer the question, where does this, this, uh, this ecosystem play? Where does Atmosphere play? Uh, it's really about anywhere. Um, there's no specific market that we are targeting with this product. That's really ever, wherever you have a zone, a need for a zone-based audio system is, is where this can actually, actually live. Um, so we'll go ahead and go over the, the host processor hardware. Um, so first off, there are two models. Um, so there's an eight zone and a four zone. And as you can see, the, the four zone is the smaller one or the half rack space. And then the eight zone is a full rack, but both one U. And we call those the AZM-4 and the AZM-8. Uh, just some shots of what the hardware kind of looks like uh, in the 3D. And the half rack. Um, I'll mention that um, uh, where the rack ears are included in the box um, for both the AZM-4 and the AZM-8. Um, now we'll just go ahead and go through a quick overview of the front panel hardware. So uh, we, we thought it was important to include a, a screen of some sort on, on, the, on the front panel here. Um, one of the things that, that we kind of, when we were talking to customers and, and integrators about was, you know, the, how easy is it to get to the point where you can actually start configuring a box? And one of the barriers is always, you know, connecting, you know, that first initial connection to the box can sometimes be painful. Um, so we went ahead and put a color display on the AZM that always displays the IP address. Um, and so it's easy to navigate and understand that you don't have to get out a discovery tool or anything like that. We give you the IP address right on the front of the box. Um, additionally, we, we always we give you on the home screen, uh, we give you uh, indication as to what's happening in all the zones at one time. Uh, so you can see the output signal uh, of all eight or all four zones, depending on which AZM you have. Uh, and there is a, a, a full menu structure in place uh, from the front panel. Um, so you can go in and check, you know, uh, inputs, input levels. You can check for uh, error codes um, and make, make subtle little changes to the network settings, things like that, directly from the, the front panel. 
Uh, so that's handy if, if uh, you don't want you know you don't want to get your uh, your tablet out or your computer and, and boot it up. Um, you can learn some things directly from the front panel. Uh, and then there's a status bar uh, located on the front of the product. Uh, so this basically just indicates if everything's running running well and and uh, the unit's powered up, you'll get a blue LED bar. Uh, if there is uh, are, are errors or if there's a live fault, that will be indicated in a flashing red light as well. And as I mentioned before, we do have removable rack ears for uh, if you have a shelf mount situation or it's going to end up on somebody's desk. If there's just no room for uh, for a rack, you can take those rack ears off. Okay, let's hop to the back panel. Um, so mic line inputs, um, all of them have uh, a phantom power. Uh, we have mono summed RCA inputs. Uh, we have uh, balanced line outputs. Uh, and somebody asked earlier today um, about uh, these do accept unbalanced as well. If you wanted to use a source that was unbalanced, you can do that with uh, the, um, the Phoenix connectors. Okay. Uh, so then, uh, then I mentioned the line outputs and then GPIO. Um, I'm going to go cover this in detail once we dive into the live demo. Um, and I'll just say that uh, on the box, and it's the four and the eight, it, we include six inputs, two outputs, and then a high priority input, uh, which has a very specific function, which, which I'll show you once we get into the, the live demo. Uh, and then, then uh, we also have accessory ports. Um, so these are for connecting uh, all the accessories uh, that we will offer at launch. We will launch with uh, six of them. Um, and uh, we include four on, on the uh, the AZM-8 uh, and two on the AZM-4, um, but we like to give plenty of flexibility to the integrators for system design. Um, so if you had a more centralized design where this sits in the middle of a venue, you can uh, take runs in, in all sorts of directions to minimize the, the cable run that you have to make. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll talk about uh, the accessories a little in a little bit. Uh, and then we have a network port. So if you have an existing network, this is where you can just plug it in and um, get it on get it on the network. And start working with the product. Uh, something else that we we've added, um, and we're we're kind of excited that it's there, is a, a Wi-Fi modules is on board here, um, which allows us to do a few things. Um, and I think the most exciting thing actually is uh, the fact that you can go to a job site with um, no equipment. Uh, no existing uh, IT infrastructure. Take this out of the box, turn it on um, uh, through the front panel, change it to access point mode, and uh, then talk directly to this box. Um, so it has an SSID that it broadcasts, and you can connect your device, your tablet, or your, your computer directly to it and start configuring without you know, taking a router with you and, and um, going through that whole mess. Uh, additionally, we, we can use it as a Wi-Fi bridge. Uh, so if you have an existing Wi-Fi network and you don't want to do a network drop just for this box, you don't have to. Uh, you can connect and bridge to an existing Wi-Fi network uh, if that's easier. Uh, and then the last thing it can do, because uh, there are environments where um, you don't want anything broadcasting, and, and um, you know, in particular, you have a strong IT presence. A lot of times, those, those guys, they don't, they don't want to see anything except their own stuff. Um, so we do have the ability to completely turn off the module where it doesn't broadcast anything. Uh, and then as I mentioned before, uh, the AZM-4 is, is uh, basically just less uh, input connectors and output connectors, and then everything else is the same, uh, which is important. So you don't, you don't really uh, lose anything by going, going from the AZM-8 to the AZM-4 as far as features go. Everything is, is that's in the, the bigger one is in the smaller one. It's just down to number of inputs and outputs. Okay, uh, and then the accessories. Um, the accessories are a very uh, important part of, of this ecosystem, um, and they're they're part of what makes it the, the full solution for for customers. Um, so as I mentioned, we have six wall plates or accessories that we'll be launching with and will be available. Um, and the first two are uh, controllers. So we, we do have an available uh, what we call just a CV, which is a volume only wall controller. Um, and is assignable to any of the zones that you want in the box. Uh, now the, the, the ZSV or CZSV is a, a more advanced wall controller 
that allows you to control more than just one zone. You can control multiple zones from the same controller. Um, and you can also uh, recall scenes and messages. And I'll, I'll share a little bit more about this once we get more into the live demo. I will actually set one of these up and I'll show you how easy it is. So how do we connect these? Uh, so everything's done over category cable cap uh, 5E and up. Um, and these are daisy chainable, so it's not one controller per port or anything like that. You can daisy chain these things. Uh, so if you look at the back of uh, one of these devices, you'll see an in and out in and an out port, and um, the in goes upstream and the out goes to the next device. Um, so we'll go ahead and show that. We'll add a couple of these to our system. So we've got four controllers now on our on our system. Uh, and then next up we have um, audio wall plates. So we'll have an, an RCA wall plate, a Bluetooth wall plate, and an XLR wall plate available. Um, and just a few notes on uh, a couple of these. So the XLR does include phantom power. That is, uh, you can turn on and off uh, from the UI. And then there is a, the Bluetooth uh, wall controller. We, we, we added a couple features there that are nice for commercial installs. And I'll run through those real quick. So uh, you see a, a, a gray button there that um, is very handy. So it, that actually boots the, the, the paired device off of, of, of the wall controller uh, instantly. So if, if you have somebody paired to the, the wall controller, maybe they don't know it or they shouldn't be connected to um, the audio system, you can actually just walk up, push the button, and it'll, it'll boot them off and they have to repair in order to get back on. Uh, another thing we did was um, we, we made the broadcast name editable by uh, the end user or the integrator. So um, if you have multiple of these in, of these in a place, it, we, you will ship with a name that it broadcasts and you can connect to it that way. But you can change it to something that's more relevant to the business uh, or the organization itself. So if you have, if you have uh, three of these in a, in a location and they're in three different um, let's say classrooms, uh, it's in a school, um, you can name it classroom one, classroom two, classroom three. So when you pull it up on your, your device um, to play audio through, you, you know exactly where it's, it's going to or which wall controller it is. Uh, and then the last thing we added uh, for the Bluetooth wall controller is an NFC. So if you have an Android device, uh, you can actually walk up to this and uh, hold your phone up to it and, it, and the NFC will pair it to um, to the wall controller. Um, and then uh, the reason we also included four, um, four, four connectors on the AZM-8 is the fact that you can connect a single uh, audio wall plate uh, to every port. So one, one audio wall plate per port. So it, uh, you could, in this case, add four additional audio inputs to an AZM-8 and then two to an AZM-4. Uh, so we'll go ahead and add a Bluetooth module here. Okay, and then our last accessory. Uh, so this is called the X-ANS, which stands for Ambient Noise Sense. And um, this actually is, part, is used in conjunction with our ambient noise compensation algorithm that I'll show you uh, once we get to the, the, the live demo part of, of the, the demonstration. Um, so I'll just give you a couple notes on this uh, that I think are important. Um, so the first thing is that this is a sensor. This is not a microphone. Um, and how it basically works is it does collect audio from, uh, from the environment, uh, but it processes it locally. So it crunches it down to something that uh, the host processor can use that is, and it's not audio. So it's just, it's just a data stream that's coming out of this. Uh, so uh, to that end, it, it makes it a secure solution. So with no audio going back, uh, there's no way to pick up a conversation or use this in a, a nefarious way um, since it's only sending data back. Um, and then the other, the other key is since it is sending data back and not audio, it preserves those, those inputs um, on, on the buses uh, for uh, audio wall plates. So the RSA, the Bluetooth, and the XLR. You don't have to consume an input to add these to your system. Okay. Um, and as I said before, since uh, these are data only, you can actually daisy chain these and uh, no problem. Um, so what are the kind of, kind of the rules for when you're adding uh, accessories? So uh, 
the maximum devices supported by both the AZM4 and 8 are um, uh, 16. So both boxes can support 16 per, per box, um, and each, uh, each, uh, each bus or port can support up to eight devices in a row, which I have pictured there. Uh, and then I'll point out uh, the length requirement or limitation is up to 1,000 feet, uh, which is, is quite a ways. It's, it's, you know, it's over three football fields. Uh, so even if you have a very large venue and you need to get control or you need an audio input, you know, way across the building, uh, very likely you can, you can get it done with this, uh, this box. Um, and we, we also do have the ability to have mobile control. Uh, and I don't want to say too much about how, how we kind of accomplished that, uh, uh, you know, our solution to that, but we will... Uh, later on in the demo, I'll show you exactly how we, we, we accomplished that and um, how we approached the problem. So a little bit more unique. Uh, and then it should be pointed out that uh, the, the host processors actually have a web server on board. So uh, the software is served up directly from, uh, from the AZM 8 and 4. Um, so there's no software to download. It just comes on board. And, um, and since it runs through your web browser, uh, there's, it's really hardware agnostic, so you kind of bring your own device. As long as it has a supported web browser, uh, you can get in and make changes to, to the box. Okay, and I should mention, uh, since this is part of, this is an ecosystem, we do offer two amplifiers, um, both four channels, both in one U, uh, form factors, and uh, so 100 watts a channel and 200 watts a channel. Um, now you're not required, you don't have to use these with uh, the rest of the products. I um, mean, if, if, if you have a retrofit scenario where you, you are, the customer already has uh, amplifiers in place, you know, this has balanced line output, so you could just use those as well. Um, there's um, nothing wrong with that. Okay, so um, we've made it through the kind of the hardware part of uh, the demonstration and the presentation. Uh, so we've covered um, the uh, accessories, we've covered the host processor, we've covered the amplifier. So um, at this point we're going to go ahead and switch gears a little bit and head into a live demo. Um, so as I just kind of described earlier, the, the, the process to, to get here is, um, you know, I have this on uh, my AZM on a network. So uh, it's, it's provided an IP address and I, I, all you have to do is navigate to that IP address uh, on a device that's on the network uh, through the web browser, and that's what I've done here. Uh, and you'll notice the first thing you see is a login page, so um, we, don't, we don't leave uh, the box open, so any, anybody that knows the IP address can get in. Uh, we do require uh, user credentials to get in. So we'll go ahead and log in. And uh, what, you, what you notice right away is that you, you're taken to a, a dashboard that basically just gives you an overview of your system and, and what's going on inside the box. Um, so we'll step through this real quick. Um, uh, so it does tell you, uh, kind of, it, it tells you like how many inputs and outputs you have left, things that you haven't used. So in this case, I have eight more inputs that I can use and I've got one more uh, zone that is not in use that I could use for something. Uh, we do have some, some thermal sensors on board uh, just to kind of get the pulse of, of the environment that, that our box lives in. And, uh, um, and we do have protection in place in case the thing gets a little too hot if you're in a, um, you know, just a hot environment. Uh, we, we do have a fan that can pull a little air through there uh, to help ensure the longevity of the product. Uh, and then we have this, this nice section here that just gives you a, a very basic overview of, of what's going on in all the zones. So the names of the zones, um, and then what's routed currently to those zones, and then uh, a status light. So um, if I had some signal going to this zone, it would be green. It's, it's a signal presence indicator. And if I was clipping, you know, I'd get a nice little red indicator here as well. Uh, the next box here is for faults. Um, so right now we don't have any faults, which is a good thing. We got our green check mark. Everything's good to go. Uh, but if we did have an issue um, and what we call a, a live fault, um, so it's a fault that's actually having, happening in real time, um, this would turn um, and become a triangle with a little explanation point in it, letting you know that there's a problem. And you can go ahead and click on that explanation point 
and then it'll take you to a page that uh, tells you exactly what's wrong. Um, and I'll give you one example. Uh, so we covered the, the, the wall controllers and we said you can have eight wall controllers um, or accessories on one of those ports. So what happens if you plug in the ninth one? Um, well, the box will protect itself if it needs to and shut them down if it needs to. Um, but the box will know at that point that, I, hey, I've got a ninth, ninth controller here and I, I, my limitation is really eight. So you get that little symbol here and you click on it and tell you, hey, you have a ninth wall controller on here. You need, you need to you know, fix that before uh, the error goes away. Uh, next box is uh, for the message player, uh, which we'll get to later on. Uh, but basically, this just gives you a little indicator of how much memory you've used of the one gigabyte that we provide. Um, and then during an event um, or where you're actually playing the message, uh, this will become like a little player, and it'll show the pro a progress bar uh, going across here. And then uh, from, from here, you can stop that message if you want to. Uh, and as I had said in the past, that um, since we do have Wi-Fi on board, uh, we do actually have the potential for this box to actually have two IP addresses one for the Wi-Fi and then one for the wired network. Uh, so this just uh, gives you a quick snapshot and tells you, you know, here's the IP addresses for both. Uh, and then this box here just gives you a nice little overview of what you have connected. I um, already have uh, accessories connected to the system. Um, so this is telling me, you know, I've got two CSVs, two CVs, et cetera, et cetera. This is what you have connected. And then the last box here uh, shows the, the upcoming events based on what you've entered in the scheduler. Um, so as you create events, um, this, this, uh, this will tell you what's coming next, right? This is the next, you know, seven events or whatever. Um, and it's, it's, it's just a nice little tool. So if you're, you know, owner, you can, you can log in here and say, okay, what's my audio system doing? You know, to this day, what, what do I expect? What are the events that are going to happen? You can see that here. Okay. Um, and this box really is set up, um, you can see at the top here, uh, kind of from left to right is, is, is somewhat, somewhat of a workflow that you, you want to set up a system um, and kind of follow, just follow the tabs left to right. So we're going to go ahead and step through uh, in that same way. So we'll go over to the inputs tab. Um, and you'll notice here's all the inputs and we've uh, separated them by type. So we have mic line inputs, RCA inputs, uh, the audio wall plates, uh, which I want to mention a couple things here. So you notice three of them uh, are populated and you can get into the settings and, and do stuff with. Um, uh, that's because I actually have physically connected those wall controllers. On port A, I don't have a, an audio wall plate, so it's blanked out and you can't get to any of the settings. So it recognized that uh, and knew what, what's connected and what's not. Uh, and furthermore, um, you'll notice that if I go into an RCA wall controller, um, there's EQ and auto gain. But if I go to uh, the XLR, what I end up with is, is quite a few more DSP objects available. So the gate, the DS, or compressor, uh, things that you would need for you know, um, an XLR input then get populated. Um, and that's done dynamically. If we would unplug that, the, the XLR and plug an RCA in, it would readjust and uh, just give you the, the DSP objects that you need for that input type. Uh, and then we also have what we're calling virtual mixes. Um, maybe you refer to them as a submix. Uh, but basically, you know, it, it's great to be able to route any input to any output. Um, but occasionally you do need something a little more where you want to do mix a few signals together and then get it to, to a particular zone. Um, and one, one example is, you know, if you have a space that is, is used for presentation um, a little bit, so maybe you have a microphone and then maybe you have um, some uh, computer content uh, that you're presenting and they, they just need to be in the same place at the same time uh, in the same, same zone. So uh, what you can do is you can go in here and basically just create a mix. Um, so let's go ahead and, and pick a microphone and then we're just gonna say, uh, how about a presentation mic? And then you can adjust the relative levels to get the mix right. Um, and then you can add up to four uh, four inputs per mix, and we provide four mixes uh, per box, and that's true of the, both the AZM-4 and the AZM-8. Now the last uh, input type is actually a signal generator, um, so we just have three types, uh, sine wave, pink noise, or white noise, and pink noise, um, and this is just a really a tool that is, um, is, is handy for commissioning and troubleshooting, so you can route the signal generator uh, through any of the zones 
Um, you know, maybe you arrived on the job site, you don't have any inputs yet, but you just want to get the system warmed up a bit and 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 uh, maybe do a little troubleshooting. You can we can provide a little bit of a signal for you. Okay, so let's go ahead and dive into one of the inputs. Uh, so we'll look at one of the mic line inputs uh, just to give you an idea what these look like. Um, so you'll notice up here. Um, you get this nice ribbon and these controls, which are always there no matter you know, where you're navigating in the UI uh, within the input. Uh, so you can always change the name, you can always change the level, and you can always mute the, in the input. Um, and I should note, too, that uh, this name here is actually uh, carries throughout the entire um, uh, design. So if you change a name here, everywhere else here, it changes as well. Um, so if you're, uh, let's say, uh, makes more true of outputs, but if you you rename an output, um, it, it goes to the accessory that is looking at that as well. So you don't have to change any of it. You change it one time. Um, so let's take a look at this. Uh, um, every every input and every output for that matter actually gives you a physical representation uh, of the the back of the box and gives you a little square that tells you this is the physical hardware that these controls are tied to. Um, when you get in the back of a rack, sometimes it's you know you get you get confused and you know what goes where, where am I actually at? Um, so this just helps you a little bit identify uh, physically which connector you're dealing with. Uh, and then I won't spend much time on this. I mentioned the phantom power before, uh, but the gates, uh, deesser, compressor, kind of things you'd expect from um, any uh, DSP box uh, on the input side. Uh, and then. I'm going to uh, mention something about the auto gain. So auto gain uh, is available for all input channels. And um, why this is, is kind of useful, and I'll give you two use cases. Um, so if, if you have a live sound scenario where you actually have a microphone uh, and you have you know, those people that go up to the microphone and they just shout, right? And they just that's what they do. Um, and then you have somebody that's very quiet and maybe holds a microphone further away or it's a you know, maybe gooseneck microphone and pe different people are making pages through the system. Um, this can help with that. So um, this, this uh, tries to maintain the input level no matter what, what the source is, um, whether it's loud or, or quiet, it'll try to hit an actual level for the entire input. Um, and then the second example is um, if you let's say you're you have a, a, a media player and you're playing music through as background music and you know each song's a little different one's very quiet one's a little louder um, so this can this can help gain the loud songs down and, and gain up the ones that are a little quieter to maintain uh, a constant input level to the rest of the system um, so very handy tool and, and like I said every input does have one okay so let's go back and let's go ahead and head to the output page uh, so very similar format to the input page. These are editable, um, you know, names or whatever. Um, and then uh, from here, you can change the input source and the routing. You can adjust the level, and then uh, you can mute from here as well. Uh, so let's go ahead and dive into one of these. Um, so every uh, every output or every zone kind of looks like this, and uh, you get the nice uh, little ribbon at the top here that's always there no matter where you're navigating. Um, and then um, we do have priority uh, input routing. So uh, there's two that are always always the same and, and don't change. So we have the high priority GPI input, which I'll explain a little later, but that always takes precedence over everything else. And then just we, and at the bottom, we always have um, the, the, the routed uh, source content. So it's, it's what's in this box here. Uh, but then we do allow two other uh, priority levels. Um, so one is the message player, which we'll get to. Um, and then we have one more level that you can add if you want something um, on the priority list uh, higher than what's normally in the zone. Uh, and you can change that if you think, you know, for your application, the, media, you know, the message player should always take precedence in this zone over, you know, the, the other named source or the other way. It's, it's really dependent on how you're going to use the box and what's appropriate for your uh, venue. Uh, something else uh, that we have though and is a speaker preset. So um, we want to make it once again as easy as possible to install, do an installation and uh, this is a big help to installers. So um, 
basically, you know, you, you go to our Atlas IED, you, you buy our speakers, you, you put them in the ceiling, you, you, the surface mount ones, pendant speakers, whatever. Um, and then you come to uh, the software here or the user interface and you just select which one you have. And uh, we've already tuned the speaker for you at that point and you're ready to move on to the next thing. Uh, on the EQ side, um, so on the input side, we do provide, um, we provide uh, four band EQ and on the output we do um, uh, six band. Uh, and then one other thing that's, that's unique for, um, that I wanna point out that is unique, I, I believe to, to this product is the tilter filter. And it, it does exactly you know, what you're, you kind of think it, it should do. And what, what it does is actually tilt the entire uh, spectrum, the audio spectrum, uh, linearly. So it kind of acts like that. Uh, and, and the reason this ha has value is, um, you know, we've, we've already taken care of the speaker side. We know, um, uh, we know we're, we're good there. We, we've got the, the preset there, so we're good. But now we have the venue, right? And there's all sorts of venues and there's all sorts of acoustical um, uh, issues that you can run into. Um, and there, and there's, there's a lot of methods to tune a room uh, that's been, that have been around for a very long time. Um, you can get out the RTA microphone and you can set that up and you can do the FFTs and, and, and go through that whole process um, and, and, get, and get a good result. Um, but what, what we're doing here is actually providing a tool that's much faster um, and maybe it doesn't get quite get the you know, the, the high quality of tuning of the full, you know, RTA mic and, and that traditional way of doing it, but uh, we can improve it. Um, so the basic um, method to, to use the tool is you get content going through the system and, um, and then you use two things. You use this control here, moving it up and down, and then um, you actually uh, just use your ear. You, you walk around um, and you listen and you move this up and down until it just sounds a little bit better. Um, and this doesn't take much time. Um, I, I've done it a, a quite a few times and, and every time I walk away thinking, yeah, okay, you know, such a short amount of time and I made a pretty good improvement with a very little investment. Um, so very valuable tool, very powerful. Um, and uh, for, you, for those of you that care, I believe this actually stems a lot from the uh, cinema world. I think they use this type of um, uh, type of process quite a bit. Um, so something very cool, we're excited about that and see how people use that. Okay, and then the next one. Um, so we do have what we call uh, ANC, uh, or ambient noise compensation. So this is not something new to the world. It's been around for quite a while. And, um, but I wanna, I wanna kinda wanna talk through this in a, a few steps though. Um, so the first is uh, kind of the, the current state, like how, how does ANC work today? Well, um, there's, always a, uh, there's always a sensor or a microphone, right, that's looking at the environment and trying to make adjustments based on how loud the environment is. Um, pretty straightforward concept, right? If it's louder in the environment, you want more from the audio system. If it's quieter, you want less of it. Um, however, to set up this, the, those systems and to get them to acting correctly, uh, can be a bit of a pain. Uh, there's quite a few controls to get right, and it takes you know quite a bit of experience uh, to get those systems dialed in. Um, and uh, and inevitably, right, you you can set these things up, and you'll get the customer call. Hey, it doesn't quite quite sound or act like I want it to. Can you come back and tune do some more tuning on it? Uh, so at that point, it's expensive. It's another trip, and uh, so all for you know for all those reasons, we. we we kind of sat down and thought, you know, is, is, there's got to be a better way than what's been done in the past. Is, is there something else we can do here to make it easier, both and a better experience for both the integrator and the end customer? Um, so we, what we ended up with is something we just call auto mode. Uh, not very original, but um, the technology that underlies it is much cooler. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and, and describe what you would do from an integrator perspective and then uh, describe what the user experience would be. So we go ahead and enable the ANC and we say, well, we want to do auto mode. Um, and you can see here, I've already added one of the ANSs. I've assigned it to it. Um, you can assign up to four per zone if you would like. If it's a large space or you just want better averaging, you can add a few more sensors to a zone. Uh, but for the purpose of this, I just have one. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and click on the auto mode, and you can see that right now it's flat, right? 
Um, and then from an integrator's perspective, what have I done? So I've gone in, I've put in the sensor in place, um, I've turned on the auto mode, and at that point, I'm done. I walk away. There's no configuration uh, for me to do. It actually lands on the, um, the customer themselves. Um, so then switch over to the customer perspective. So uh, what they need to do is just basically start using the system. Um, and if it's a little too quiet, turn it up. If it's a little too loud, turn it down. Um, and that should sound familiar for those that have a, a Nest thermostat at home. Um, it's a learning algor algorithm that, that, that can help predict um, what, the, what the end user wants. You know, in that case for HVAC, for our case, for audio. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and, and actually pump some sound into the space and then start making adjustments just as the, the customer would. So if I say, well, it's a little too quiet, I'm going to make a little adjustment there. Um, as more people show up, let's say I'm in a restaurant, it's getting a little louder. Oh, it's still too quiet. I'm going to make an adjustment here. And you can, you can see this thing starting to draw, draw a curve for me. I'll do one more, I guess. Okay. Okay, so let's get rid of that noise. Um, so basically what happened is, you know, w without really having any audio experience or knowing really what they're doing, uh, they're, they're drawing this curve that fits their ear. Um, they know when it's too loud, they know when it's too quiet, they know what they want. Um, so they go up and they make the adjustments and then it draws this ANC curve for them. And, and then one, once it, it, you know, we think is maybe as few as four adjustments, they can have a curve that they'll like. Um, and now it's learned what they want, and now they surely shouldn't have to touch the knob anymore. Um, now, that doesn't mean they can't make changes, and this is one of the cool things, too, is that the alg algorithm continues to learn. So if you have, a, let's say, an environment where, um, you know, they, they liked it that one day, but now they want to make a change. They don't have to call you to do that. They simply go over to the wall controller again, make their adjustment in real time, and the, the curve readjusts. Um, so it is. It does learn over time, and like I said, eventually they shouldn't have to touch uh, the gain knob uh, in that zone again. So very excited about that. We do have a few patents that are, that surround this. Uh, that we're once again very very excited about this, and we want to see how this gets used in the field. But um, you yeah, we think we've we've somewhat demystified uh, A and C. Um, and then I'll just mention we do have a limiter on all the outputs, which you would expect. Okay, so let's go ahead and jump to the message player. And um, I already have some preloaded messages here, but uh, the basic uh, process is this. Uh, you know, first thing you need to do is have content on board that you can use. So let's go ahead and upload a file. So I have a blue dot wave file. So I'm uploading that. And now I, I can see it on my list. Um, and there's a preview, a local preview function here. So if you have a bunch of files that get in there and you're not sure exactly what they are, if, if you, you know, kind of click play while, while you select one of these, um, it will play on your local device and it won't play out throughout the whole system. Um, okay, so we have our content on there. Uh, the next thing to do is define a message. Um, and uh, let's go ahead and let's just create a new one, I guess. Sorry, it's at the end of the day for me, so you don't get creative names. Okay, so uh, just a new message. Uh, first thing you need to do is say, well, which, which audio device do you want to be part of this message? I want the blue dot one we just uploaded. Uh, you can add a little gain or subtract or, um, uh, uh, yeah, take a little gain away if you want. You need to normalize to make sure it sounds good through the system. So we'll just add a little gain. Um, and then the duck amount, how much do you want to pull the other audio down as this takes priority? Um, and you can add pre-message delay, post-message delay, uh, and then you can repeat the message up to, I believe, 10 times. Um, but we won't do that. We'll just do it once. And then uh, you just tell, well, well when, when this is recalled, where do you want it to go? Well, let's send it here and here and, you know, here, you know, whatever. Um, and then there's different ways to trigger this and, and actually use this. So I'll describe them, and you haven't seen them all yet, but I'll... I'll I'll at least describe them. So you can just click the button here and it'll play the message through the system as defined. Um, you can also tie it to a GPI, uh, so a contact closure voltage trigger uh, to play the message. Um, you can also um, use the ZSV or the, so one of those wall controllers can actually recall a message. Um, our mobile solution that I'll show you uh, can do that as well. Uh, and then, um, 
I'm missing one. I think that's it. So we'll go ahead and actually demo that. Please stand on the blue dots while waiting in the checkout line. Thank you. So you can hear the message come through and um, uh, and I just want to note as well, we are working on putting a, a, a small library together. Uh, maybe it'll be a big library. I'm not sure yet that we'll, that uh, people have access to to go download if they if they need content uh, to upload uh, to the box. And then finally on, on message player, if you go to the last tab here, what you see is uh, priority. So um, in the event of a collision, right, you know, two messages want to be playing at the same time, you know, who, you know, which one wins. Um, so this list can, can define that, and you can move them up and down until the, the, you're satisfied with the order. Uh, so let's go ahead and move on to GPIO. Uh, we'll start with the inputs. Uh, so you can see here that uh, you can opt these in, basically to enable or disable them. You can give them names if you'd like, um, and then you tell it which trigger method is going to be used. So depending on the hardware you're hooking up, it can either be just a straight contact closure, or you can actually provide a... Um, a voltage trigger to the box. Now, um, there's two actions that you can do. So you define um, what it does. So you can recall a scene or you can recall a message. So let's say I want to recall um, uh, just a message. So we'll play a quick message. And I have a contact closure here. So I can play, play the message there. Uh, and then we're going to skip uh, the output section here, and we're going to jump straight to the high priority input. Um, so this is a a, a very I want to say unique uh, input scenario, but like th this is purpose built for for doing something. Um, so basically, this is when you, when you're in a scenario where you need to take over the box, or something else needs to take over the box. Um, that's why we call it high priority. But let's go ahead and enable that. And uh, same thing as all the other GPIs, it can be a contact closure or voltage trigger. We do allow the ability to um, actually lock the wall controllers. And so you can't make any adjustments to, um, to the system. And then we also take advantage of all the LEDs we have on board of all the, the controllers. And we flash those red to get people's attention. Uh, so we'll go ahead and click that. And then there's three things you can do during the event. One is, is uh, let's say, a life safety system um, that has the buzzers, that has their own speakers. Uh, we can just get out of the way. So if we click this, that means everything's just muted and we're, we're out of the way. Uh, the other thing we can do is we can force all, all the zones to listen to a, a, a selected input. So we can say, yeah, we want everything pointed at the, the paging mic. And then we also have the ability to change the, the gains on both the inputs and the outputs, which basically guarantees end-to-end -end that we can get that message through. Uh, and then the last one, uh, we have uh, the ability to play a message. So we can recall a message, uh, which more automates um, this event. Um, we still have the same controls where you can force all the outputs to be at a certain level. And then you can either play the message one time and be done, or you can continue to re continually repeat the message until um, the event is over. So um, this would require a contact closure um, that would have to be remain closed during the entire event. So we'll go ahead and do this, and I'm going to go ahead and bring up some of the extra hardware so we can see that that operate. Uh, okay, so consider this a small system, and then we'll go ahead and. Okay, so you can kind of see how that works, um, that we get all the wall controllers turning red, um, the message played, and um, that's, that's our high priority input. So let me get rid of these. Okay, so let's go ahead and step to scenes. Um, so scenes, um, you, may, you may call them presets, maybe an appropriate word. I know I've heard thrown around a lot, uh, but in concept, right, it's you, you set up things beforehand and then you recall those settings and then they go con configure part of the box. Um, so we'll go ahead and create a new scene. My scene. Okay, so everything's opt-in, so you don't have to force changes onto zones that don't need to be changed or are not used. Um, so we'll go ahead and opt a few in. And, and what, you, what you can change in those zones are three things. You can uh, force a change in, in a source. Uh, you can 
change the level, force the level to change, or you can force a mute or an unmute. So we'll force a mute there. Um, something else that you can do is actually include a message with that. So I'll include the chime there. Uh, and then you can also uh, uh, take advantage of the GPO. So there's the two uh, GPO ports on the box. Uh, and you can uh, set, set that port high, set the port low. You can toggle it from whatever state it was in, or you can do a pulse. So maybe we'll do a pulse of, I don't know, 100, 150 milliseconds. Um, so, and this, this one's useful, you know, if you have like, let's say a projector you need to turn on, you can't actually trigger it from the box, set the audio uh, all from a scene. Um, so that's the scenes, everything's opt-in, like I said. And we're gonna go ahead and skip accessories for now, and we're gonna come back to that because um, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, so just real quick on the scheduler, um, it, you get this nice little calendar here uh, that you can actually, you can, can schedule a couple things. So we'll go ahead and create a new one, uh, event. Um, and then you pick what you want to have happen. Do you want to recall a scene or do you want to play a message? Well, let's play a message, that sounds like fun. Uh, and then you can pick the color that you want this to show up on the calendar, well, I like orange. Uh, and then you tell, well, when do you want this to occur? So um, we can do a one-time thing or uh, we can recur, let's say on Fridays. Oh yeah, this is gonna be a party because it's Friday, okay. Uh, and then you pick a time. So 4.47 on a Friday, uh, sounds good to me. Uh, we'll play this message, so okay. So you can see it added it to uh, my calendar. Uh, that will also be on the dashboard now. Um, when it's when it's time for it to, to uh, enact itself. Okay, so that's the basic scheduler. I'm gonna hop back to accessories now. Um, and um, I think for the sake of time, we're gonna skip. No, we, I think we have time, okay. So how do you program a CV? Uh, pretty basic, um, single click. Just tell it which zone you want it to be part of and it's that zone. Um, and there's no, once you, you'll also notice what's missing here is a program button. Uh, these, these changes are all live. So if I go here, it's now controlling zone seven. Now it's zone six and that's in real time. Okay. So let's go ahead and, and then uh, configure a ZSV. Um, and actually before we do that, let me, let me point out one other feature that we do include here. Um, uh, there we go, okay. Um, so once you get a lot of these in a system and you know all the wires in the wall, they've covered it up, you, you can't trace it very easily. Um, we do allow a locate feature. Uh, you can see it flashing behind me to help just find the physical devices and match it up to the controls in the UI. Okay, all right, so let's go ahead and hop into our, our ZSV. Um, so uh, first off, just like all the other um, physical uh, connectors, we do provide you with this little picture and tell you which port it's connected to and actually which position. So this is the first position on port A. Um, and then you'll notice a big old QR code, which we'll come back to what that is for. Um, so uh, just like the scenes, these are, these are opt-in as well. So let me go ahead and opt-in um, zones that I want to be controlled. So let's just pick I don't know, three of them. So these are the zones I want to that zone or that controller to have access to. Uh, and then in each zone, you select which inputs you want to be routable to those zones from the wall controller. So let me just select some of these. I'll select I don't know, some of these. And these, these changes are, are live on the actual hardware. I can bring that up. Uh, and then same thing with scenes and messages, you opt in, what do you wanna have access to on the ZSV through here? So um, you can kind of see here, maybe it's hard to read, but all the, the zones I opted in are now here. Um, the scenes are there that I opted in. Uh, so everything's live, everything's in real time. Uh, and now the screen settings. Um, since we have a full color screen, we thought we'd, we'd um, add some um, nice little tricks uh, for the for the end customer, um, so we we include two uh, two themes, so a light theme and a dark theme. So uh, maybe one fits the the environment more than the other. Um, uh, we, you can change it, and then um, we also have a dynamic mode where you can actually change uh, from light mode to dark mode. Uh, let's say at night you just want it to be dark mode, which which kind of makes sense. There's less ambient light in a, in an area, 
Uh, so then we can set it on based on the clock and it can change dynamically. Okay, uh, then we also have a screensaver and uh, you notice there it went to a QR code which we'll get to. Um, or you know, on a screensaver you can have it just go to the home screen if you just want it to always look like that. Uh, you can basically turn it off, you have a black uh, screen. Uh, or you can uh, just have a nice little clock there that shows, shows the time and the date. Um, and then you can set the, the amount of time it takes for the thing to, to time out and go back to the home screen or go to screensaver mode. Uh, and then one other nice little touch that I, I really like is the fact that you can actually have a pin code uh, en entered onto the ZSV. So if this isn't a public space or um, you, know, you, you, just, you, want, you don't want anybody walking up making changes, uh, you can protect the controller with a pin code. So they'd walk up, uh, they'd have to turn and, and enter a code that was correct before they could gain access to uh, everything that we just opted into the system. Okay, so that's that's basically how you configure a wall controller. Um, and now we're going to actually go back to uh, the QR code. So I mentioned before that we, we do have the ability to um, provide mobile control, uh, which is very important in this day and age. And how we do that is since our, our, our host processor is uh, has a web server on it, we basically uh, tie a link to, and this, that's what this QR code does, we tie it to um, a web page that our box serves up. So there's no app um, to download it. It's, it's literally just taking us to a web page that was designed to work on a mobile device. And I'll go ahead and show that now. So I have a mobile device here and we'll go ahead and uh, you can see that there. So my, my camera recognized the, the address, so I click that. And what you see here uh, is now a, a well, something, something that looks very much like an app, but is not. It's actually just uh, a web page. And now everything that, all that programming we did or the configuration we did of the ZSV is now in the palm of my hand, and I can take it with me. Um, so you can recall scenes, all the scenes we opted in are here, all the messages we opted in are here. I can play, you know, straight from, from um, just because of the QR code. Um, now, what becomes interesting though is the fact that um, uh, because we have the web server already on board, we already have, um, let me navigate back here. We, are, we, already, we already have everything we need to do mobile control. We don't need the physical hardware. Uh, so we do allow the ability to add virtual wall controllers. Um, so you can opt in just like we did before, create the, 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 the wall controller, opt the stuff in that you want, you know, scenes, messages, whatever. Uh, and then you'll notice here, here's a QR code. Um, and that can be distributed and printed off and you know, hung on the wall and there's your wall controller. Um, and we actually include on board the ability to um, print off directly from our box. Um, so we cut out a lot, a, lot of, a lot of the work for you. And once you print it off, uh, we actually include in the box, uh, so every AZM comes with one of these, we call it a gem. So once you print off the QR code uh, you, you, and you cut it out, uh, you actually stick this inside here. It's a nice little plastic holder that has double sticky tape and then uh, two holes for screws if you want to put it into a stud and you put it on the wall. Uh, it's about the size of a credit card or so. Uh, looks real nice and um, it's, a, it's just a great, great solution. If uh, you need control in a space and you can't, you know, it's maybe cross prohibited to get wires there and do a cable run like that, or maybe the cost of the project was a little, you know, you wanna bring it down a little bit. So this is a solution that, that solves a lot of problems. Um, there, there's, there's a bit more to show, but uh, in the interest of time, I want to make sure that I have a little time to answer questions if there are any. So uh, we'll go ahead and uh, basically stop the demo right here. And um, uh, I'll ask uh, our moderator for questions and I'll answer as many as I can. And I'll apologize up front if I don't get to your, your question. Um, I, I, uh, don't, don't be offended. Uh, please reach out to the Atlas I, uh, IED sales guys. Uh, they'd be more than happy to get you, get you uh, answers to the questions um, and get in contact with me if, if need be. Um, so, okay. What is the largest audio file that we can load um, and how much space is available for audio files? Uh, so we do allow one gigabyte on board of, of memory for 
for messaging and uh, what's the largest audio file. So we allow, um, I'm not sure the exact uh, uh, megabyte size, but it, I think we allow up to 12 or 15 minute length of a WAV file, and they do have to be a WAV file. Um, okay, another question. What is the maximum uh, preamp gain on an XLR? Uh, so the XLRs, we actually provide um, 60 dB of uh, preamp gain. Um, and maybe you're asking on the output side. On the output side, I think, um, I want to say 20 to 24 dBU would be on the output, um, the output side, if that's what you're asking. Uh, and then what is the range of the Bluetooth wall plate? Um, as with anything that's RF, it depends on the environment, and I'll have to, I'll have to put that little caveat in there. Um, but we've tested um, in excess of 100 feet, um, uh, somewhere around maybe even up to 120 feet or so uh, of what we've been able to get out of the Bluetooth module. Um, yeah, um, I just want to then thank everybody for taking the time to go through the demo. Uh, like I said, if there's further questions or you just want to know more, um, reach out to the Alice IED sales guys. They'll be more than happy to, to get you in touch with the right people or answer the questions and just uh, get you more information. So um, once again, just appreciate the time and uh, enjoy the rest of your day.